We all know them. They are the terror of the table, the saboteur of the sheets, the nightmare of the newbie DM, and the destroyer of a thousand games. That guy. Well spoken of in role-playing game parlance, it is every player's fear that they will one day be forced to play alongside that guy. Or even worse, discover that they themselves are that guy. But do not worry, Dr. Discourse is on the case, and if you have ever wondered about whether you've accidentally strayed a little too far into the Nightmare Zone, then you'll want to pay attention because we're going to talk about the three signs of a that guy in D&D. <laughs> Oh, uh, DM, I have my character sheet and a uh, backstory here. Uh, there's like four different books here. This one here is called The Underworld's Chronicles. Yeah, that bit is pretty dark. And the uh, bigger book, that is the history of my dragon lineage. Uh, okay, but I only asked for a couple of sentences for your backstory. I tried that, but the section about how I molded with my twin soul beyond the gates of Loon ended up running up a bit longer than I thought. I could send you a couple of email summaries if you'd like. No, that's fine. I suppose I should just be happy that you're invested. Um, right, so it says here that you have a plus five Vorpal blade? Well, yeah, but how else was I gonna kill the Jabberwocky and see if Toontown from losing all of its colored ink? You get that you're level one, right? Okay, so we all want our characters to be special. Ask any player about D&D, and they will inevitably begin telling you about their character. Seriously, it's just a reflex, like how a turtle moves its legs when it's placed upside down. They have no hope of being turned over, but yet they still try. And that's natural. It's normal. Our characters are how we interface with these fictional worlds. They are our ludonarrative representation in the game space. They are our creations, our babies, the marvels that we make upon the world and say I was here I existed except that we're playing Dungeons and Dragons and we start at level one which means our character is a goddamn chump if you want to be cool you gotta earn it or play something like Exalted. And yeah, okay, you can totally have a cool and interesting backstory for our character. Maybe you grew up without ears, I don't know. But the reality of D&D is that it is designed to accommodate certain types of games. Namely, that epic music video from Hercules, signed by the Muses. You started as a wimp, and you end up as the Huncules. From zero to hero, just like that. It's built intrinsically into the system of the game. It has a level up system. Every player has a level and those levels represent power. You start at level one, the weakest level. So actually, no, it's probably not appropriate that your player character is a 300 year old and yet looks like an anime princess because of her travels into the void to defeat the metaphysical concept of death in a duel of Beyblades. Well, that one is inappropriate for lots of reasons. I beat death in a contest. And how did you do that at level one? I picked heads. A good way to avoid this when making a character is to think of the actual game of D&D as the most interesting moment in your character's life. The first scene of the game is the first scene in the movie that they are now starring in. The game is an opportunity for you to tell an awesome story with your friends at the table. If you want to tell an awesome epic story in your character's background, then you want to use Amazon self-publishing. Go join the other grits like Empress Teresa and My Immortal. So this is a pretty big red flag. If someone insists on making their backstory inordinately important and onerous on the rest of the party, then they might just be that guy. Ah, adventurers, you have finally arrived to the hidden cloister of Reggie Doolittle, keeper of the thousand xylophones. Welcome to our abbey. Ah, greetings, priest. My name is Elstar, and this is my companion, Hawk. We have traveled from far away and look forward to enjoying your hospitality. And, uh, this is your holy xylophone shrine, then? Oh, it is. We are charged with its protection. All right, well, Hawk unfurls this majestic member and just starts spraying urine all over it. What? Why? Hey, it's just what my character would do. Really? What person would actually do that? We have all been there. It's an important moment and an NPC has come to deliver us a grave request. Or a negotiation is occurring. The party could avoid trouble if they choose the words carefully. And then suddenly, that guy speaks up. The old man struggles in his shackles and he looks at you. You'll never get that information from me. 
I'd rather die than reveal the secrets of the chocolate fountain. I want to stab him in the face. That's what my character would do. What the hell, dude? He was the only person in the world who knew how to make the everlasting gobstopper. Without him, how are we now going to save Candy Mountain? And disaster! The game is disrupted. Now, we're going to get a little bit controversial here. I'm a tad bit outspoken on this point. See, I'm actually a strong believer in doing what your character would do. Embracing the character that you're role-playing and their ideas about what is appropriate. The fact is, when we sit around a table to play D&D, we're there to role-play. We're there to figure out what our characters would do in certain situations and then do it. That's the fun part of the game. If we didn't want to do that, then we'd just be playing Gloomhaven. The fact that our characters are different changes the texture of every game and makes it unique to our table. Running pre-written adventures would be so boring if there wasn't different characters playing it every single time, making each playthrough different and unique. In short, it's what my character would do, gets a totally bad rap. Players should do what they think their characters would do for sure. In and of itself, that ain't a problem. That said, it's also the job of players to create characters for the game that, well, fit the game and do things that are conducive to the core gameplay loop of the game. This is where things like Session Zero come into play, where you can actually figure out what the point of the game is and what the goal of the party is, and they make a character to suit that. Thus avoiding becoming that guy. If you're going to be playing a dungeon delving combat game, maybe don't play a consummate coward. I can tell at Session Zero that a cowardly character will be trouble in this game. Likewise, if you're about to play in a game about a murder mystery at a fancy dinner, then maybe don't play Grognar, Tigger of Skulls, and Stealer of Linens. You know, unless the entire party and DM are fine for you to explore those characters in a context that clearly puts them out of their element. Being a fish out of water can be fun, but only if the ground is happy for you to splash all over it getting it wet. The problem isn't whether someone does what their character would do, but actually the problem is that their character would do the thing that will totally ruin the game for everybody else. I once played a character that was very quick to anger. His name was Heinz, yes, just like the beans, and he was a light, and I really mean light. He was 17 years old and he thought himself invincible like only a teenager can. He wasn't evil or a murder hobo. He didn't kill people for no reason, but he would start fights in bars. He would steal things. He would make fun of people. He would run his mouth when he probably shouldn't and he was happy to headbutt someone in a bar because they spilled his drink. So you know, don't spill his drink. What's important though was that I, the player, was able to rein him in a little when it really mattered. It wasn't like we were ever interrogating an important NPC and I suddenly decided to take out a knife. Hey guys, you ever seen the inside of a large intestine? Yeah, before anybody else can react, Hawk unsheathes his blade and slashes the throat of the captive, killing him instantly. Okay. What the hell, dude? Hawk gets to his bloody work, removing the large intestines, holding them up for the party to see. Why are you like this? No, I was a bit of an ass, but I wasn't a psychopath. And that's because I knew the party I was with. I knew the players, and they were comfortable with me playing a character that might cause trouble every so often, but would also stick to the party and look out for the, uh, <clears throat> weedier members of our group. Now that's quite a bit different from someone that is simply looking to destroy the world around them and totally disrupt the experience of everybody else at the table. Remember, D&D is a group storytelling game. That means it's a party of many people collaborating to tell a story, not a single character dictating the actions of everyone. The problem with the it's what my character would do trope is not that someone is playing out their character's decisions with verisimilitude, but that their character's decisions are batshit insane and completely derivative the game, contrary to the desires of the rest of the party, and it no longer makes sense to the other players as to why they're even with that character anymore. Really, the that guy move here is selfish role playing. Okay, Hawk, with that roll of 20, you managed to sneak past the mad cheesemonger, entering his underground lair. A dozen Gargonzola Gorgers are dozing in the first room that you enter. The floor is wet and slippery from excess milk. Your first step is treacherous, and you struggle to keep your footing and avert waking the Gorgonzola Gorgers. Give me an acrobatics roll. All right. Hey, it's another 20. Wow, you've been getting pretty lucky tonight. 
The milk was extra slippery, so you did need a pretty good roll. Nice going. So you managed to keep your footing, but remember, the Gorgonzola Gorgers can sense the flesh of man and grew ravenous in its presence. To get past these beasts without stirring them, you'll have to give me a pretty difficult stealth check. Okay. Hey, what do you know? It's another 20. Wow, okay. Can, can I see the roll? Sorry, I just picked it up. Okay, sure. Well, you reach the bag on the far side of the room. As you take it off the wall, you find that it is filled with different types of cheeses. Huh, that's unexpected. What kind of cheese is it? Give me a knowledge cheesemonger rule. Okay. Oh, man, it rolled off the table. Oh, look, though, it's a 20. Really? Another 20? Have you rolled anything other than a critical success all night? It's not fun to acknowledge, but cheating in D&D, it happens. And look, Dungeons & Dragons is cooperative. That means that if you're cheating, then you're not beating someone else at a game, but it does ruin the game all the same for everybody else. Like we mentioned earlier, people's characters are special to them, and D&D is set up so that everybody shines at different things. Unless you also play a ranger, Devin. Everybody should get times to be in the spotlight is my point, and a player that is artificially succeeding at every challenge takes those moments away from everybody else. It also ruins the fun of a game because Dungeons & Dragons is all about feeling forward. Failures keep the game interesting. Waking up some Gorgonzola Gorgers isn't the end of the world. It's a combat session. It's a risk that is being diminished by cheating. Feeling to convince NPCs, feeling knowledge checks, these all add to the texture of a game and can dramatically alter the decisions of a party. Succeeding at everything takes the sucker out of victory. It makes the game boring and it's obnoxious. I played in games where I'm like 99% sure that somebody was cheating because they succeeded at everything. And I'll tell you right now, those were the most boring, uninteresting characters. And interesting characters are more important in D&D than powerful ones. And interesting games usually spring up from failure. The best Star Wars movie, Episode 5, obviously, is the one where the heroes failed. Good stories need conflict. And the heroes of those stories need to fail sometimes to keep that conflict interesting. But really, when you cheat at D&D, you're denying yourself the opportunity to make that mark of greatness, the true mark. How we react to failure. Remember, when Viggo Mortensen kicked that helmet, he broke his toe. That was a field rule. But how he reacted to it, falling to his knees and delivering one of the most powerful wheels in all of Hollywood history was the true mark of a hero. Characters don't always have to succeed, even if they are, well, Viggo Mortensen. Perhaps at some stage I'll talk about pop culture that is more recent than 20 years old, but today is not that day. Plus, you know, if you're cheating at D&D because you can't handle the idea that your character could feel at something, then you're investing way too much of your self-worth into your character, and you should probably get that looked at by someone who doesn't go by the name of Dr. Discourse. So, cheating. If you're cheating at D&D, then you are 100% being that guy. Oh, on a bonus sign of being that guy, you must pass what I call the Vib rule. Named after, well, Vib. And that rule states that you must be able to say your entire race and class combination in a single breath. Uh, that one dates from the 3.5 edition of D&D. Luckily, it's not quite as relevant these days. But it still stands. No feral, half-ogre, centaur, half-dragon, fighter, barbarian, frenzy, berserker, weapon master, disciple of the speeder. Uh-oh, that just passed the rule. I guess this whole YouTube thing did come with one benefit. I can say ridiculously long race class combinations in a single breath. Not quite Superman level, but you know, I'll take it. And there we have it. The three marks of that guy. Luckily, people who are that guy can change and can become better players by bearing all of this video in mind. Unfortunately, that guy is a bit more rare than the internet might have you believe. Not every single party has one, although one is destined for every party, so keep an eye out. That does mean, therefore, that there is a surplus of guys out there somewhere right now. I, a single D&D party from hell, floating along quietly within the Rule 20 group listings, comprised entirely of that guy's, like a radioactive Marie Celeste, seeking to unhook unwary players and DMs into the game from hell. So just remember that next time you put an application into a 
five pro players looking for one more to join game. And on that cheery note, check out this time that I was that guy, sort of, and support my Patreon if you enjoy this content at patreon.com slash discourse miniatures, and a huge thanks to Sonic Bray, CryptoCav, and John Smith, and I'll catch you all next time. Bye bye